If you've made character models before, but you still feel like there's something lacking with your texture work, then this volume was made with you in mind. In this volume of the 3D Character Art for Games video series, I'll be going over the creation of effective textures and fine-tuning them for a game engine. We'll be building from the kinds of maps that were mentioned in the previous volume, and as I've been saying all along, the final results heavily depend on every step that came before. So please do check out the rest of this video series in order to get the most out of this video. Actual techniques in using the software is very important, and I'll certainly be going over that, but more important is developing your artistic eye to recognize what needs improvement and knowing how to act on it. There is no real shortcut for learning that, but I will be pointing out the things that I like to look for um, to get you started in the right direction. I'll be demonstrating the creation of textures using Photoshop and 3D Code. And for the game engine presentation, I'll be using Marmoset Toolbag. I mentioned in the first volume of this video series that I would be using body paint, but I've decided to demonstrate with 3D Code instead. I still think body paint is an excellent painting application, and there are a lot of features that it has that I miss a lot, but uh, 3D Coat is just a much more affordable package, and it has a lot of other functionality that I think makes it more attractive for most artists and studios, and is probably more widely used these days. Uh, please keep in mind that as with all of the videos in this series, the specific software that you use is really not that important. There is a push right now to move game graphics rendering to something referred to as uh, physically based rendering or shading, also known as PBR. This is something that has come along in the last year or two uh, with the next generation of game engines, but I want to make it clear that this technology is still in its early stages and very few games make use of it at the moment. It will become more widespread in the future, but for now I think it's still a good idea to learn about um, the older specular-based rendering technology um, that has already been in use. I think it will still be around for years to come, so don't feel like you're going to be missing out if you don't pick up on PBR right away. My Hella model was created with an earlier version of Marmoset Toolbag without PBR, so a lot of my discussions on her textures will be with that older technology in mind. Uh, I think you'll find that the adapt adaptations that you need to make to work with PBR are actually pretty easy if you already have some experience with um, the older method. So, you know, knowing one will give you a, a big head start on learning the other. So before we get into making the textures, I wanted to address in general terms what I think makes a good texture. Uh, I want to dig a little bit deeper than the obvious, which is that you know a texture should help the model look like what it should look like. There's a lot that goes into this artistically that can be easily overlooked. Below are some of the main points that I'll be touching upon briefly here so that you can keep them in mind as I demonstrate the creation of textures in greater detail later on. Before you start texturing, it's worth reassessing what exactly it is you're going for as far as art direction. In a lot of games these days, you might think that you can get away with just making things look realistic. But even in a realistic game, there may be some things that you need to pay attention to. For example, uh, there could be a certain level of surface noise that you need to maintain on all of your materials in order for your character model to fit in with the rest of the game world. Or maybe the tone of the game demands a certain color palette or uh, a certain treatment to um, how you do worn edges or things like that. Any game worth its salt has had a lot of thought put into the art direction and you should be sensitive to these kinds of things. If you're creating your own art piece, then it's going to be up to you to be your own art director and to think about how your project should look. Start to look at the games that you play and the games that you like and try to break down their art direction to better understand why it is you respond to it the way you do. As I mentioned in the very first volume, my Hella model was intended to fit into 
a fantasy world along the lines of a game such as Terra, which is uh, an online MMO game uh, that originated from Korea. Uh, with this in mind, there's automatically a certain aesthetic that I start to think about and how I should uh, treat the textures. In a game like Terra, uh, there's an emphasis on keeping the material definitions realistic, but on the idealized side. Um, and for me, this means that um, you won't see excessive amounts of wear. Um, you know, you won't see you know big uh, dents and um, scratches and you know dirt stains or uh, that kind of thing. Um, the the arm should still look you know realistic. It should still look like it's it's been been used, uh, you know, lightly used. Um, but it's definitely uh, more on the side of being well maintained and not not as gritty as what you might see in uh, some other games. Uh, the characters themselves, uh, you know, their the bodies and their faces uh, often are very idealized. You know, they're uh, almost all with supermodel good looks and uh, you know uh, adhering to uh, a certain. Uh, standard of beauty that you know whether or not you agree with it um is kind of besides the point it's just uh it's something that in that that kind of game it it's just kind of a given and it's something that you should uh consider if if that's something that you're pursuing for yourself uh and you know to, if you, another thing that I, I really think um, helps define this kind of art style is um, the usage of color. Um, uh, I think that the color usage is often very liberal, and uh, you know there's an affinity for palettes that I associate with a, kind of a, like a youthful fancy. You know, there's um, uh, less hesitation to use uh, color palettes that include uh, pastels and. Uh, a lot of warm and inviting tones. Uh, it, even in a, a design that's a little bit uh, darker and cooler in temperature, kind of kind of like my model here. Um, I, there's still, you know, ways where you try to inject some warmth and saturation, uh, just to help bring the character more in line with uh, the rest of the art direction of the game. Um, in this case, you know, there is no real game that I'm making this for, but um, I, I was definitely thinking about it, you know, in terms of, hey, do I think this character model could fit, could feasibly fit into uh, a game world such as Terra? So, you know, they have some uh, key areas like these splashes of magenta in here that um, that really help prevent the character from becoming uh, too monotone and, um, and and desaturated because if you look at most of our armor here it's mostly a gray but you know I find find ways where I can to to add some some variety in there um, w without breaking the the overall look of uh, of the character the next thing I want to mention is contrast Contrast is probably the single most important thing that you need to control in your artwork, and it all starts back at the sculpting stage. We've already gone over um, the modeling part of the series, but I want to reiterate the kind of impact that this has on the perceived value range of your textured model. Um, there's no amount of texture that can fully fix a model that has uh, contrast created through depth and what I mean by that is um, if you made your high resolution model um, in a way that has too much depth or not enough depth, then this will immediately start you off with the wrong levels of contrast. Um, if you take a look at my model here, um, this is the, the sculpt of, of my Hella model. And let me just isolate this one part here. If you notice the the details, um, you know there's a reason why I have some of this detail more lightly sculpted than the rest. You know I wanted uh, certain areas to 
come forward to the eye and some parts for it to just kind of be um you know just kind of recede in the background as as a, a little bit of uh, detail but not something that um the the viewer should really dwell on and let's say i did something like this i have this on another layer i'm just going to turn this on where you can see i've increase the depth of all of these details around it so when you look back at it from a distance if I, if I toggle it on and off you can see um, the kind of effect that this has you know um, this uh, where everything has uh, about the equal depth um, you know uh, things start to get kind of visually confusing and you can you can probably see how if this was uh, done throughout the entire model then uh, there would be uh, th things would just look very busy and confusing and I think this is probably the number one problem that I see in a lot of uh, sculpts I mean this is a besides problems such as uh, anatomy and um, in general things like that it, just not having the control over the contrast of your model is uh, is is going to be a, a big problem because you know when you take this if you bake this normal map you know you're kind of stuck with it and uh, no, no matter if you painted anything light or dark in the texture you still have these depth problems that you that you can't really get rid of so you know again uh, make sure that things uh, are as um, as correct as you can on the sculpting stage you know you look at your model as a whole and try to plan where you want um, these kinds of uh, details now on the texturing side of things the values that you pick for your textures will probably have the next greatest effect on your artwork and uh, this is where you want to pay close attention to your references to make sure that your model um, has the impact of the original design. So here I have um, two of the textures that I use on my Hello model. Um, this is the clothing on the left here, and here's the skin on the right. And I wanted to show this because um, I wanted to visually demonstrate um, the how I've arranged my values. And you know, these are obviously turned into grayscale. Um, on on the left here that for the clothing you can see that most of the clothing pieces they are um, you know they, they don't have a w wide range of values I mean there's enough for, so you can see what's going on but you know I don't have a lot of uh, bright highlights in there for example um, I'm, I'm saving a lot of the the higher key values for the skin here you can see the skin is a lot lighter and um, this is because you know I made a conscious decision to have it so that the the skin on the final model if you go back to uh, Marmoset here the skin on the, f the final model it, it stands out from you know from a distance you can see you can clearly see the separation between um, clothing and the skin so you know the, I think this is something that uh, you know another common mistake is that um you know there might be a this um this urge to paint you know excessive shadows into the skin or um trying to uh put higher values or higher or lower values in areas that where you know they don't really belong uh, now obviously there are some cases where um, this is fine you know if she had you know if she was wearing a white t-shirt or something like that and obviously you know her her skin I mean her uh, her clothing there might be as high of a value or maybe even higher than her skin um, it, it just all depends on the situation uh, and it it's just something that you have to think about when you're looking at the original design you know whatever concept you're using you know really take a look at what kind of values are being used there you know assuming that the, the concept got it right you know really taking a look at the value ranges there and making sure that you are representing them accurately in your textures 
So it it's just you know if you think about your your texture, um, like you know any one of these things from having a value range of from you know zero but being black and you know say a hundred being white, then it's you don't need an eco distribution of all of these values throughout your image. You know for the skin you might want to keep that in the um, you know you know maybe like the the seventy percent range, and then um, this clothing here on the, on the left maybe you know maybe that's like a a thirty or forty percent value range and, and you know you can deviate a little bit in there just enough to create some of this detail but you really don't want to push things um, you know have a great uh, difference in values right next to each other unless you know that's part of the design when I say material definition I am referring to how closely the materials on your model resemble their counterparts in reality for example making metal actually look like metal uh, wood look like wood, leather like leather, etc. Instead of simply relying on um, the color to to convey the material. Now, successfully creating material definition usually is achieved through balancing um, the shader, in the properties of the shader, and the textures that feed into it. This process can vary depending on what game engine you're using, but I'll go over some of the basics that I think are pretty much universal, at least in concept, if not the implementation. The value of convincing material definition is difficult to overstate. And I say this because I admit there was a time when I didn't put enough inf effort into it myself. I used to believe that uh, doing anything other than painting the textures by hand was considered cheating. And because I favored stylized art, um, I kind of felt like I could get away with um, not really putting that much effort into material definition. But, you know, looking back at it now, I can say that I was really just being lazy um, and somewhat closed-minded about my approach. In a production environment, you're going to have to be open to using any methods that help you get the job done better and faster. And, you know, that could mean using some photos um, ref in your in your textures or it could just mean um, amping up some uh, noise a little bit in some areas or you know things like that of course the amount of material definition that is right for you is going to depend on the art direction of your project but I think in many cases even stylized artwork can benefit from some degree of material definition. And, um, you know, if, if you're wondering, you know, what, hey, what if my project is cartoony? Well, that you have to know when to play to the strengths of the medium that you're working in. And 3D art usually excels in providing visual fidelity that other mediums can't. So, you know, comparing you know, 3D artwork with uh, 2D cartoony work isn't, you know, you, it's not something you can really do. Um, remember that one of your goals is to create something that is visually compelling and finding ways to introduce variety in material appearances can go a long way towards doing this. There's a very good reason why 3D animated feature film characters, for example, um, often have realistic textures and shading and lighting, you know, it, you know, regardless of how stylized the art is. A model can still be readable and appealing without material definition if it has good contrast and colors. So I'm not saying it's more important than those things, but spending the time to really convey the materials will set you apart from other artists. This can also mean knowing when to ease off on materials to fit the art direction. You know, you don't want to go crazy and make everything look like concrete, you know, you know, unless the art direction calls for it. So, you know, part of what makes your model successful is going to be having the viewer looking at it and understand everything about it at a glance. You know, they're not distracted by uh, the materials being um, too busy or distracting because they're confused as to what material it really is. 
And finally, um, the last thing I'd like to say about textures is just uh, the general technical execution and polish of, of them. And what I mean by technical execution is just mostly making sure that things work as intended in the target game engine. Your texture should be tuned with the final game result in mind. So it doesn't really matter how well painted your texture looks in Photoshop if it doesn't look right in the game engine. Uh, you're probably going to run into some situations where you have to do unexpected things to your textures uh, in order for it to look good in the game. Um, sometimes it might actually look pretty bad. You know, if you're looking at your diffuse or your albedo texture, sometimes um, it's not going to be a very intuitive, uh, you know, what you see is what you get. What you, what you paint is not going to be what you see in the final uh, game result. And that's perfectly fine as long as you are, you know, working towards making the final result look better. Uh, polish is a pretty broad category that encompasses um, some smaller points such as, you know, keeping your work uh, clean and organized, um, having, you know, keeping your textures optimized, not having too many layers that are unnecessary, and keeping things um, in such a way where it's easily editable. Uh, once you're done with your textures, you should take some time to to tie up any of these loose ends, uh, and just make sure that everything is to the quality level that is required of you. Part of being a professional is making sure that everything works even when the model is out of your hands. And I'll go over this in greater detail as we go along, you know, how strategies on how to uh, keep your your files uh, in, in such a way where it's going to be easier for other people to work on. And also for yourself, you know, if you have to come back to it later on for whatever reason. All of these points should do good things for your model. Artistically, it should help the model's overall readability while still creating a cohesive look between the character model and the rest of the game. Viewers will be able to understand exactly what they're looking at without having to think twice about it. And that's one of the most important things that you can achieve in a game model. When texturing, I think it's useful to approach it with the right mindset. Uh, I think a lot of people hear about uh, painting textures and they think that there's um, actually a lot of painting involved when really there isn't. Um, especially with the, the way textures are done now with uh, normal maps, um, there isn't a whole lot of actual painting in the sense that um, like compared to the way things used to be done with diffuse painted models um, where you would you would actually paint in all of your details but now uh, you want to rely as much as you can on the normal map and so uh, a lot of that that painting can actually be de destructive it can actually confuse um, the normal map and create a muddy result so um, it's best to approach it with a systematic approach um, you want to find a way to make your texturing as uh, consistent and as um, as simple as you can. Um, I know a lot of people hear that and they might think that, hey, this, this doesn't sound very artistic at all. Um, but really, the art side of things has, it hasn't gone away. It's just moved to a different part of the pipeline. Um, a lot of that art is now um, been pushed up to the modeling. So, you know, you actually want to get all of your your forms and your shapes correct on the model, so that when you bake the normal map, um, you have that information captured. And so, um, the the actual painting part, you're still going to rely a lot on um, getting the right colors and and compositionally how you. Uh, arrange your your values and your details, but um, it it's is better to approach texturing with the mindset that um, you're not going to actually be painting in the sense that uh, that you may be used to thinking about. 
I bring this up because uh, I see a lot of models where the artist will do a lot of heavy-handed painting in their textures, and um, this, a lot of times, um, it, it can just make the, the overall presentation of the model look worse, um, especially if you are trying to paint in a lot of lighting and shadowing information that, that will conflict with um, the lighting that is seen in the, the game. So, uh, I mean, this isn't to say that you shouldn't paint because, I mean, you will be painting. You will be painting uh, gradients and um, wear and tear and, and things of that nature. But um, the more you do that, uh, you, you just start to tiptoe a line that uh, you might want to avoid crossing. So... It's just a, another thing to to keep in mind. Uh, I, there are some art styles where it, you you know maybe okay to paint more, um, but it, that's something that you're going to have to make a judgment call on for your your own project. In the last volume, uh, we left off with having baked several kinds of maps to create textures with. Um, but what exactly are all of these? textures for and why are there so many of them? Well, it really depends on the kinds of shaders that you're going to be using. Uh, the shaders, to put it simply, are instructions that tell the game engine how to display the model. Uh, depending on the project, the kinds of shaders that you have access to uh, is going to vary. Um, some games with uh, strict technical limitations may have uh, fewer shaders. Um, you know, sometimes you might only be able to use one shader for the entire character. And so you're going to have to find a way to, um, you know, create different materials like, you know, hair, skin, clothing, uh, metal, you know, all that within one shader. And, and, you know, when just only one shader, sometimes the quality can suffer. But, you know, that's just the nature of game development. Uh, some higher end games, um, you know, that really push the visual bar. You know, maybe you, you'll have more than than one shader. Maybe you have one for each of those uh, different kinds of of, of materials. Um, in my demonstration here, I'm going to be using several different shaders to give uh, more breadth to the instruction, um, but. For you, you you have to decide on you know how many shaders are going to be right for your project. Uh, for your portfolio, um, you know if you're a beginning artist trying to get into the industry or something, it might not be a bad idea to you know just shoot for the stars, make something look as good as you can, use as many materials as you want, um, because you know real world situations with game shaders can can vary so much depending on you know what what project you're on what game engine you're using so you know that kind of thing i think it's not that important to worry about you know the shader optimization that's just such a a big subject that um, you can't possibly know everything about in advance so uh, my advice is to uh, impress first you know and, and apologize later so you know just make sure that your model looks as good as as you can um, still adhere to restrictions for polygon counts and you know texture sizes and and the, the number of textures that's something you should still try to um, keep as optimized as you can but for material uh, for shaders you know I wouldn't worry too much about that as you may have guessed by now, uh, when you're making your texture, you're, go you're going to be saving your file over and over and over again, um, so you can see it updated in your game engine. Um, there are a lot of tools out there to help you do this more quickly and easily. Um, if you go to the Polycount wiki, there's a section for Photoshop tools, and you can see here are a bunch of um, Photoshop uh, scripts, most of them, or plugins that um, can help you save uh, textures very easily. For example, you can have uh, layer groups for 
each of your different maps in your PSD, and then you can hit hotkeys to um, export each of of these um, layer groups into um, a Targa or a DDS or whatever file format you intend to use. I'm not going to be demonstrating the use of these um, in my own demos, but I definitely I definitely recommend you check out um, something like this to help you to work more quickly. Before we dive into the actual textures, let's uh, take a quick look at the working progress of, that I use on this model. Um, I have some a series of images here. Um, this, this is after I've baked my maps, like you know the AO, the normal map, and you know whatever else I, I thought I needed at the time. And at the moment, all it is is solid colors. I, I do have you know, gradients for the the feathers here and some of the hair, but pretty much this is all. Um, solid colors with an AO on top and not much work done to specularity at all. Everything is pretty much the same. Here's a close up. You can see it, you know, these, you got these horrible black shadows because all I'm doing is just kind of like multiplying the, the AO on top or something like that. And here's a little bit further along. You can see I'm starting to get some material definition there because you know I've got specular differences between you know the metal here and you know the cloth and the other areas. Starting to add a little bit more refinement to things and more in generally more detail, like you know, adding uh the red trim here and uh try uh at this moment at this time I'm trying to figure out a color scheme for uh, the staff here because I, I, I actually never got um, a color concept for this. You know, I just had line art and I was trying to f figure out how to reconcile, trying to make it fit her, make it look like something that she would wear that would accessorize well. And here's uh, a little further along again. Um, you can see that, let's see, what's, what's different here? I'm playing, I'm adjusting the colors. I'm um, trying to um, decide where I really want saturation to be and, you know, it, making judgment calls on what is standing out too much and what do I really want to draw the attention of the viewer towards. And, you know, we'll go into greater detail when I'm actually talking about um, the individual textures and this is getting closer to the end here. I, I've refined a lot of of things. The you can see that I've I worked on the transitions, such as you know from between the head and the hair, and um, adding some some more warmth to her skin. Just trying to make her feel a little bit more alive, and and you know refining the the gloss maps, making sure that all the subtleties of the material definition are reading as well as they should be. And here's a, a view of her skin without the subsurface stuff. So you can see here, you can see it's a lot, you can feel there's a lot more warmth to it than compared to here, which is you know kind of like a, a corpse or something like that, or a statue. And this is kind of the final result from um, rendered in the first version of Marmoset Toolbag. And I, I brought her into Toolbag 2, which does a better job of the skin and the hair highlights. Um, and I'll, I'll show you that right now. Let's see if I switch to the main camera here. See, I have uh, some better highlights in the hair. I've got kind of like an anisotropic. Um, highlight going on there and I'll, I'll show more of that a little bit later um, let's see and also the the skin shader is, is better in Marmoset 2 you can see the uh, subsurface scattering going through the the ear there but yeah let's uh, go ahead and move on and and talk more about uh, the textures and, and how to set up the scene so before starting on any 
of the actual texture work in Photoshop, I like to bring my model into um, the, the target game engine. In this case, uh, I'm going to set to a bag 2.0. Now, my model was originally made with tool bag 1. Um, so there will be a few differences uh, that I'll point out as, as we go along. But, you know, it's, it's not too big of a deal. So I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are probably familiar with how this works already. But you know, the first thing you do is you import your mesh. Um, in this case, I had split up my model into these pieces to make it easier to assign uh, the materials to them. Um, as far as I know, Toolbag still doesn't have any support for like material IDs or anything like that. So you can't really assign uh, materials per face. Um, would be it would be nice to have, but for now this is fine. Work around just splitting up your model and um, dragging you know your material onto onto the respective mesh. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm I'm just gonna actually talk about the the clothes, the clothing material uh, shader here. Um, it it will give you kind of a good idea of how all those stuff works, and I'll, I'll go through some of the more particular um, topics about the other things a little bit later. But for now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, get rid of a lot of my textures here, just to kind of bring it back to a state where um, it where what it might look like when um, I first when we first start after you first bake you know fresh from the oven after you've baked your maps and I'm going to switch the my sky scene here you can see I have uh, which one do I have selected right now um, I think I is it the foyer yeah I think so I'm using the foyer right now but uh, I recommend picking um, an environment that is a little bit more neutral. Uh, personally, I like to use Ennis House. I mean, that looks terrible right there, but if you turn the light around, okay. So the reason I, I picked this is because you can see there there isn't a whole lot of uh, colors in, in the scene. And this is just helping me get a more neutral environment to to start my textures off with. Uh, now, a little bit later as I, I go along, I will jump back to something else like like the foyer or whatever uh, for my presentation, and I'll kind of tune it for that environment too. But you know, at the beginning, just I recommend picking something more like this, where the the lighting is more neutral. There aren't a, a lot of strong shadows or anything that can. Uh, impair your judgment on how to create the textures properly. Okay, so so this is kind of what I'm going to be starting with. Um, you know, you, you bring a model in, you, you take a look at it here, uh, just just to make sure that things are, are working correctly, you know, your neural maps are, you know, going the right way, and uh, there aren't any weird artifacts, there aren't any baking errors, you know, things are, are looking are looking good before you proceed. Uh, 